Texas here in Norfolk is not just a car manufacturer, they put up a name for technical excellence, so they do a lot of design consultancy for other companies. As you would expect, that expertise is built into their own products. This engine, for example, that goes into the current Esprit has a very high power output for a relatively small unit, and yet manages to meet all the current emission control regulations, largely through the help of this three-way catalytic converter. Compulsory, of course, in the States, this is one of the few cars to carry a converter in this country as well. The converter will eliminate most of the air pollution and the acid rain caused by carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides, but it doesn't help with the other main pollutant, carbon dioxide, and that's a major greenhouse gas contributing towards global warming. In fact, by abandoning lead in fuels and using a catalytic converter, we accept a fuel consumption penalty that can be as great as 15%. So, by helping the local difficulties of smog and acid rain, we make worse a global problem of heating up the planet. So, what can be done about it? Well, during this spring series, we want to look at various possible ways of improving the situation. There are, of course, political and social strategies. We're going to concentrate on the technological ones. Can the engineers provide a complete technical fix? Or will the best they can do mean only a partial reduction in carbon dioxide pollution, like, for example, using petrol more efficiently or turning to more economical fuels, like diesel? But let's go back to the basic problem. Why do cars churn out carbon dioxide anyway? That's because petrol, like most of our fuels, is a fossil fuel based on compounds of carbon. So burn petrol, which is principally hexane, you get carbon dioxide and water. The carbon will always end up as carbon dioxide. So the only ultimate solution is to dispense with fossil fuels altogether, but it's a tremendous list. Coal, oil, natural gas, propane, butane, LPG, CNG, methanol, the lot. Of course, all fossil fuels are really just solar energy accumulated millions of years ago and conveniently stored in the ground for us to use now. It's a unique process of photosynthesis in green plants that captures the solar energy, stores it as carbon compounds, incidentally using up some atmospheric carbon dioxide in the process. So why not short-circuit the photosynthesis and storage phases and convert current solar energy directly into power for vehicles? Well, it's not as fanciful as it sounds. In fact, Chris Goff has been to Switzerland, where they're doing it now. Now, the basic device that captures the energy of the sun and transforms it into electrical energy is the solar cell. We've seen solar cells in calculators and small electrical devices for some time now, and very successful they are. But the output of each solar cell is very low. Low or not, GM demonstrated with their sun racer that you can use direct sunlight to power a car, but it was hardly a practical runabout. Now, here in Switzerland, there's several companies building electric cars. This is the Friedes Solar. Now, at first, they put solar panels actually on the car, on the bonnet and on the roof. But the solar panels are expensive and the power output, again, is very low. When you realise in bright sunshine, all four of these panels can only contribute 80 watts. And this little car needs 4,700 watts to drive it along. So all the panels do is give a very low trickle charge during the day to the battery power that essentially makes the car go. The Swiss now accept it's more practical to put the solar panels on buildings and plug in the batteries in the car once it's parked. That way, on your return after work or shopping, the car's ready for the trip home. On the move, it's much like any other battery car, simple to drive but slow and noisy and with a range of only 50 miles, not much for an outlay of almost 8,000 pounds. Well, we've been driving for about 15 kilometres now, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm fed up with this little electric car. It simply isn't a practical form of everyday transport. So there is no doubt that direct solar power is not going to be a universal replacement for petrol, not for a very long time anyway. But it can help in some places. There are, if you like, niche markets for it. That's a very important concept when trying to solve these problems. There's no single answer, no universal panacea. We're going to have to adopt a dozen or more different solutions. Now, the solar car used batteries, and of course electric vehicles like this G-Van have been around for donkey's years, so can they provide a clean solution? Well, it depends really on where you draw the boundary. The electric vehicle itself can be absolutely clean, but generating the electricity it uses can be very dirty indeed. For example, the solar car is clean, and batteries charged from solar cells is also a clean way of getting the power. But if you plug this chloride G-Van into the British main supply, the electricity it's using 
is generated largely by the burning of fossil fuels, so very dirty indeed. Only about 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear sources. So although in theory you can get a reduction in carbon dioxide pollution by using electric vehicles, in practice, if you take the vehicle plus the energy supply system, you're not much better off. If you take the lead-acid battery that powers this vehicle, it's an old technology and one coming very much to the end of its development. You have to carry around a tonne of these batteries in order to get a one-tonne payload and a range of about 50 miles. And although General Motors, for example, got a great deal of publicity when they showed their electric impact vehicle at Geneva, it has a very low coefficient of drag and good acceleration. But the technology, the battery technology, is the same. Therefore, perhaps it shouldn't be taken too seriously. What will change things is when these sodium sulphur batteries come into production and chlorine have a pilot plant opening in Manchester in the summer. They're much lighter, of course, built into monoblocks like this, which contain 120 of them. In this vehicle, they would almost double the payload and more than double the range. Now, that may not be very impressive for the average family car. It wouldn't meet all our needs, but they could fill another market niche for some delivery vehicles, extending, if you like, the milk float principle. And there's another useful contribution that these batteries could make. Forget carbon dioxide when the problem is localised toxic emissions, as in Los Angeles, for example, petrol vehicles may be banned completely. And already in Switzerland, there are laws allowing vehicles, petrol vehicles, to be banned from the centre of towns on days when pollution is bad. So what about a dual vehicle with a battery for those bad days in town and a conventional engine for longer journeys? Well, as we saw last week, Audi Volkswagen had two such hybrids at this year's Geneva show. The Audi Duo drives all four wheels, but with two separate systems. A conventional petrol engine at the front, and batteries and electric motor at the back, powering the rear wheels. The system in this diesel Golf is rather more sophisticated. The conventional clutch is replaced by a compact electric motor, so that either diesel or electric, or indeed both power sources, can be used according to load or emission requirements. In longer journeys, for example, you use the diesel engine. In towns, you can switch to the batteries. When there are hills to climb or you need acceleration, both can make a contribution. So a very neat and effective solution. Well, there's no doubt that the redesign of cars to reduce pollution is going to be a dominant theme of the 90s. Next week, I'll be looking at another alternative to fossil fuels.